Awesome. Well, it's great being here this afternoon. I wasn't here this morning because I live in New Hampshire. So I didn't want to fight traffic, but uh, made it down here today. I, <laughs> yeah, don't want to fight traffic, especially down here. Um, I think the first re, uh, the first AW, I was going to say reinvent. The first reinvent I went to was actually, I think, less than 4,000 people, which I think this year is going to be 50,000. The first AWS event that I attended in Boston was about six years ago. There's uh, probably two tables over here was the extent of the meeting, maybe three tables. I actually met the founder of Cloud Health at that meeting. He was trying to look for customers, and there weren't a lot of customers. Um, so I've been at AWS for about six years now. Um, there was about 15 services when I joined. I think we have 130 services now. So I like to say we've come a long way um, in terms of services, but also hybrid. When I first joined AWS, you could not utter the word hybrid architecture even. If you said hybrid architecture, Andy Jassy would throw you out of the room and say, that is not what we do. We do all in. We do you know, Pinterest and Instagram and Airbnb and Netflix, and they're all in. I don't know why enterprise customers shouldn't be all in. So I think we've uh, come a long way and realized that there's a lot of enterprise customers out there, some of them locally that I work with, uh, Biogen, Mass Mutual, Dunkin' Donuts, which is now called Dunkin', I guess, um, that are hybrid cloud. So we're listening to our customers. One of our core values is customer obsession. You've probably heard some of our leadership principles. And our customers have told us we want to hear more about hybrid cloud. So I've been presenting a lot about hybrid cloud in the last six months, and actually working on a white paper and an e-book around hybrid cloud. So expect that out fairly soon. Um, not that I came here to promote my new book, but I just authored a book with three other colleagues called Cloud Native Architectures. For whoever asks me the most innovative, interesting question, I'll give them a copy of the book. So I can't afford to give out multiple copies, because the other leadership principle at AWS is frugality. So I have to be frugal as well. So I, I ask you to ask me questions, confront me, tell me I'm wrong, tell me you're seeing other things, because this is just my perspective and the customers that I've been working with and what I'm focused on and what I'm seeing. I'm going to talk a lot about case studies at the end. First, I'm going to talk about something called uh, that I just came up with, an idea of around foundational layers of hybrid cloud, as well as use cases that go into these. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about migrations, because if you're not migrating, you're probably not doing hybrid cloud. But I guess you could argue like disaster recovery, um, archiving, things like that don't require you to migrate and still operate in a hybrid cloud environment. So transforming to cloud, I mean, everyone's probably seen these, right? No? All right. Well, Gardner came up with these. I was actually working at Oracle before. I've been at like I said, AWS for six years, but prior to that, I worked at Oracle. I did a lot of transformation and migration at Oracle as well, uh, migrating to this, something called XData and XOLogic, the hyperconverged systems. Uh, now I, I do other things, obviously, but um, these were from Gartner in, like I believe, like 2008 or something. They came up with these re's, and a re-host is essentially a lift and shift. And if you take a look at a lift and shift, it's usually a compelling event. Condé Nast, who was one of our early customers. They had a data center closure. So they had to get out of their data center in four months. And in fact, if you ever watch the video, it's pretty cool. They actually show these sun blades being moved out of the data center, and then they show, they show them putting a for sale sign in front of the data center. So that's really, a lot of times, people do lift and shift or rehost, And it's basically taking what you have, and some people call it like lifting and shifting your mess, because you don't really change it all. You just take what you have. You have compute on, on premises. You move it to, to, to virtual compute or maybe to VMware on AWS. Or your storage, you keep it the same. So you're not really changing anything. If you have an F5 load balancer on premises, you're just moving it to F5 on AWS. Like I said, Condé Nast has been doing this, Capital One, GE, a lot of our big clients. It's a great way to realize some cost savings right up front. And we see people getting, gaining like 20 to 60% cost savings in doing free hosts. The other one is replatform. And replatform is you have a relational database on premises, and you might replatform that to, say, Aurora. So if you have like an Oracle database on premises, you're keeping it relational, but might move it to Aurora Postgres on AWS, or maybe move it to NoSQL, although that's almost getting into re-architecture a little bit. 
but it's, it's, it's changing your platform a little bit. I mentioned F5 load balancer. So if you have an F5 load balancer on-prem and you decide to move that to our ALB or network load balancer, that's a, that's a re-platform. So you're changing little components of your architecture, but you're not rewriting your application. Um, FINRA is a good example of this. They process like 75 billion transactions a day on a Hadoop cluster. So they were trying to do that stuff on-premises before using traditional databases, and they moved to Hadoop EMR on AWS. So reprovisioning SaaS. So this is, and I see people doing this about 25% of the time. So a lot of times you wrote applications like 30 or 40 years ago, and there wasn't anything to sort of do that on premises before. And so you rewrote it. You wrote a custom application to say do inventory control. I mean, now a lot of people run, you know, SAP and Oracle and all these COTS applications, or like a Workday application to do human resources. So you take a custom application and replace it with a SaaS platform. We have Amazon Connect now which is a call center app. So if you have a call center app that's custom and you want to move it to AWS and use this sort of strategy, you could do that. And then the last one is re-architect. This is where it's more invasive. So you might move, say, a monolithic microservices to a microservices architecture or to a cloud native architecture like Lambda. So you're really pretty invasively going into your application and changing your application from one language to another or, like I said, monolithic to microservices and cloud native. Uh, examples of that, and I'm going to give you two examples, uh, one with Capital One, one with uh, Vanguard, as well as there's other examples out there I'm presenting with uh, Fender Guitar. They've, they've moved from a sort of monolithic architecture to Lambda serverless on AWS, and that was a complete re-architecture. Well, so how many people in this room with the company they work for have a hybrid strategy or are doing hybrid? So, yeah. Well, according to the statistics by IDC, 80% of customers are looking at some type of hybrid. And this is because you can't go into a Capital One or a GE or a Johnson & Johnson or a Coca-Cola and, ex and expect in five years they're even going to be transitioned to AWS. In fact, if you look at our journey, which we're going to make public fairly soon, is we have a journey to, um, to move, to, we have been on a long journey from moving to monolithic to microservices. We embarked in that journey in the early 2000s, and we're still not done. So this is even for Amazon.com, it's been you know, a, a long journey. And then uh, most virtualization, you know, most, most systems on premises are now virtualized, thanks to VMware. They've been pervasive in the enterprise. And so why I bring this up is it makes it easier to move, right? Because we're all virtualized, right? So if you're moving virtual to virtual, it's, it's easier than moving physical to physical. And what customers we find asking for is, well, one, is they want sort of, in a lot of cases, a single pane of glass, but they also want some type of integration, right? They don't want to throw away what they have. And that's one of the things I always emphasize when I talk about hybrid cloud to people is that it's not like a rip and replace. We have this concept of a one-way door and a two-way door at Amazon. A one-way door is a very, very difficult de decision, sort of like uh, creating a phone, like the Amazon Fire phone. When you made that decision, that was a significant decision. It didn't work out too well. But you, you think about it a lot. Uh, but this isn't like a one-way door decision. You can still have stuff on-prem, and then you can run some stuff on AWS, and you're going to be on this journey for a while. So that's what we're also hearing from customers. They, want, they don't want to rip and replace everything and just throw it all in on AWS. I want to skip that slide because I see already that I'm, I'm going to have some good stuff at the end, and I want to cover, start covering this. So uh, this is a new model I came up with. Forgive me for my skills on PowerPoint. I'm not the most fantastic you know, sort of graphics artist here. But how we're taking a look at hybrid cloud, and you're the first audience to see this, is this is a new slide on, on how we're looking at hybrid cloud in terms of a foundational layer. So if you take a look at any use case, like running tester dev on AWS, or running spot uh, to do cloud bursting on AWS, you're probably going to need a data integration layer, right? You're going to somehow have to get that data from on-prem to AWS, and maybe even every day you're going to have to synchronize that data from on-premises to AWS. Say if you're doing a data warehouse on AWS, you need to synchronize that somehow. You're going to need an operations management and monitoring platform, right? You're going to need, and this is where I get into single pane of glass, whether it's actually a single pane of glass or not, 
or you allow people to actually go into the AWS console to do things, you're going to need some management platform, right, to provision your servers, to provision your infrastructure across on-premises and AWS. So compute over here, compute over there. Also your applications, right? You're going to need a CDCI pipeline in order to deploy both to on-premises and AWS, and then monitoring. I mean, we have CloudRot, right, in order to monitor our services, but what are you going to do for on-premises? Are you going to then take those CloudWatch metrics and then move them into an on-premises environment? You're going to store them in a common repository and allow one platform. There's something, a concept called cloud brokers out there. A lot of the big uh, providers like BMC, CA, that have been in the management and monitoring business for a long time allow you to do some of these things around management and monitoring. And then security, you're going to want to not get rid of Act Microsoft Active Directory or somehow integrate it into your on-premises Active Directory. So security is a foundational layer. And then networking, of course, right? You're going to need a network, whether it's a VPN or whether it's a direct connect, you're going to need some type of network. And then in terms of hybrid use cases, and I've thought about a couple of these other ones after I put this slide together. Uh, but migrations is a common use case, disaster recovery. A lot of people, when they start on AWS, doing disaster recovery, and whether that's active-active, sort of cold backup and restore, disaster recovery is a common hybrid cloud use case. New products, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that with an example from Capital One. Edge systems. So doing things like Lambda, compute at the edge on edge devices is edge systems. And then cloud bursting is, is a common use case. I know even for the last, I've been in the industry for a while, about 15 years ago, everyone was always talking about this idea that compute was just going to be like all over the world, right? And you're going to be able to push workloads where they needed to be. It's never really happened, but we are sort of getting there now with the cloud and having the capability to run your data anywhere in any region. But uh, I'll give you an example of that as well. And then data center extension, which is a classic example of, say, running parts of your SAP system on premises and then parts of it on AWS. So you're running your core ERP on premises and then running, say, SAP HANA to do analytics on AWS is a uh, data center extension work, uh, case. So the foundational layer is networking. I'm assuming, and I'm just going to, I can fly through this slide because everyone knows networking, just extending your own network slash 16 network into AWS, private and public send nets. One of the first things you're going to do, right, when you're setting up a hybrid cloud environment. And then uh, for those folks that aren't familiar with our, some of our ways in order to integrate with Active Directory, so we have access and identi identity and access management from AWS, right? But you want to be able to do authentication um, against your Active Directory, right? So you can run an Active Directory using one of our quick starts. If people aren't familiar with quick, quick starts, it's a good way to quickly get started on, say, Oracle, SAP, any of our partners on AWS, you could install and run and manage your own Active Directory on AWS. If you don't want to do that, we now have a managed Active Directory on AWS. Or if you're saying, hey, all my stuff is on-premises, everyone needs to integrate with my on-premises stuff, you can, you can use our AD connector in order to, to then connect back and do SAML integration back into your Active Directory on-premises. And then data integration, uh, storage gateways is, is, is really one of the fundamental layers when you're going to do DR, backup and restore, right? So what storage gateways allows you to do is synchronize that iSCSI, that SMB, that NFS drive into AWS, instantiate those objects into S3, and then be able to then instantiate those and tie those uh, to an EC2 instance in order to do you know, backup and restore on AWS. Um, so, and then of course Amazon Glacier Storage Gateway also supports tapes. So if you want to do archiving into Glacier, you can do that. Uh, and then like obviously everything is stored in EBS snapshots. You can use you know companies like Cloud Endure, Cloud Vlocks, Zerto, and things like that to actually snapshot your EC2 compute or, or your instances on prem, your raw device, your raw um, compute on premises into um, EBS snapshots that are stored, or um, AMIs that are stored in S3. And then Snowball to move your data at first, RDS to do um, sort of disaster recovery of relational databases. And Amazon MQ, I don't know if folks are familiar with this, is fairly new service from AWS, is that we've taken um, the Apache MQ and now it's a managed service. So you think of like what we've done with RDS and it's a managed service for SQL Server Oracle. 
Um, this is a managed queue that we'll manage for you. So that plays big, I think. And the reason I call it out is it plays big into the whole hybrid cloud scenario, right? Because messaging, anyway, applications typically uh, talk through messaging, right? And you're not going to be able to move all your applications all at once. If you have some huge monolithic application, what I find in big customers is that those applications are t all intertwined, right? And you're not going to be able to move them all at once. So how do you, how do you get that communication to happen be between on-premises and AWS is you use a queuing mechanism. This is brand new for those folks that haven't seen this. And this is really shocking to me almost because, you know, Storage Gateway was one of our first solutions that actually ran on-premises. And I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. We're actually running something on-premise. But it was a VMware instance running this Storage Gateway on-premises. But now this is actually a piece of hardware. So it's almost like a storage hyper-converged system that will actually run in your data center and, and, you, and, and have the same functionality as, um, as the storage gateway, the virtual storage gateway has. So um, the reason we introduced this, obviously, is some people don't, are still like, hey, I, I'm not into using virtualization and all, all of my stuff. I actually need an appliance. I want a physical appliance in order to do this. And, and like I said, this is, this is new as well. Um, if you're an enterprise, they're probably running JMS standard protocol in order to do queuing. And so if you want to exchange messages with a message-oriented middleware on premises, you can do that through Amazon MQ. So any application that you then move over from on-premises into AWS, you don't need to change it at all, right? Because it's still talking JMS. It can just talk to our queue, and then it can be brokered back up and talk to applications that are residing on-premises, on, on, on yeah. No, it's not using custom API. It's not like uh, SQS. Um, like, so they compare to like RabbitMQ? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Fully, Rabbit fully featured and all that? Fully or? fevered. I would say that, I'm on camera. Um, I would <laughs> say that, you know, it's probably not as fully functioned as like IBM MQ series or like TIPCO enterprise message bus, it doesn't have quite the adapters. The one thing it's missing is really like out-of-box adapters for like Salesforce and SAP and all these things. You would have to still code some of that stuff. Okay. It's, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you, it's a publish and subscribe queuing system. So it's a bit different than SQS. Like SQS is a simple queuing surface service and it has endpoints exposed publicly so so it is different from that perspective I mean you can access it globally it just it just doesn't operate the same way as SQS but that's one of the reasons that some people didn't like that in the enterprise um, just like well I, I could go I could go off tangent there in s3 I mean s3 has public endpoints and one of the it's gotten some people in trouble right so, um, so this is SSM. Have people heard of SSM? I, it's been around for a while, but it hasn't gotten like a lot of play really. Uh, the thing that you may not know is that you can do it for on-premises instances as well as AWS instances. And so what it does, it allows you to manage, configure, patch, secure, upgrade, update, and configure your instances both on AWS and on-prem. Right? So think of it as a, as a way to do infrastructure in a manner where it's all scheduled and configured and done, handled through this, this system so you don't have to SSH into a computer. I mean, one of the things that you know, everyone's trying to get away from is, right, is, oh, I need to make a change. I need to op open up a port on a machine. I need to SSH into that machine. I need to do something with it. This just runs the EC2 um, run command, so you can run patches and upgrades. And it also gives you that consistent configuration across on-premises and AWS. So any, any security, any agents, anything you need to run on those instances can be part of these configurations that reside in this, in this service. This is obviously for infrastructure. And then for applications, 
for folks that aren't familiar, is AWS Code Deploy. And just a little bit of a history here is Code Deploy came out of a, I'm going to call it a product, came out of an internal tool at Amazon.com called Apollo. So Apollo was something we wrote for ourselves. Um, you might have heard the stories of you know, how AWS got started, how we existed. We were excess capacity at Amazon.com. Forget about all that. Although what we did see is that it took Amazon.com months to procure hardware, provision hardware. And then we also talk, took a look at our systems and said, holy shit, we got a, we got a lot of monolithic applications. We got a lot of manual deployments of applications. So we created a system called Apollo, which did, which did code deployments. So it turned into AWS Code Deploy. So there is, you know, some of the inventions and innovations that we do at Amazon.com become part of, of AWS. In fact, the overarching thing here, which is called Code Pipeline, was actually a tool within Amazon.com called Code Pipeline. So <laughs> we didn't get too sophisticated there. We pretty much called it the same thing that we use internally. So I came up with this idea. How, are folks familiar with an AWS landing zone at all? Yeah, a few people. I asked this question to a bunch of internal AWS people recently, and a lot of them weren't familiar. This is a concept, actually, that's been at AWS, around at AWS for a while. So what happens is when we go into a, all these customers I talked about, when we go into Hess, Coca-Cola, uh, and now, um, Condé Nast, I mentioned, all these big customers, there's a few things that everyone needs to do. They need to set up with someone accounts. They need to figure out their account structure. They need to set up their VPCs. They need to figure out their VPC structure. They need to figure out how many subnets they're going to have, how many VPCs they're going to have. They need to figure out how many accounts do I have? What kind of accounts do I have? Does each developer have their accounts? Do I use IAM roles? They also need to figure out how many VPCs do I have? Do I just have one massive global VPC? And then I stratify that by subnets. Do I let, you know, does developers, does one set of application team have their own VPCs? Do they have their own account? Does each, so there's all this setup that's required. And then, of course, everyone's doing, using Splunk, and they're using different uh, systems in order to look at their logging. Where do I put that? Is there recommendations from AWS where I, how I set up my VPCs, how I set up my account structure, how should I set up my security groups? All this stuff is like pretty much 80% the same across all these companies. So we created this thing called Landing Zones, which essentially has the best practices for how you set up your account structure, how you set up your security baseline, how you use CloudTrail, how you use CloudWatch, how you use your monitor monitoring services as well, and, and log reporting. And it gives you an account structure as well as a VPC structure in order to do that. And then if you set up a new account, instead of each time going out there, it has this concept of an account vending machine so that your configuration is going to be the same each time in terms of security and configuration that you go out and set up an account. All right. So I would highly recommend taking a look at landing zones because landing zones going forward are going to be something, if you're working with AWS, you're working with your SA, the two things you're probably going to hear about is one, landing zones is well-architected. If you haven't heard of well-architected, um, ask your SA too. That's best practices around performance and scalability, reliability. So this is just a, a simple diagram showing you a potential using Direct Connect. So in case you need that low latency, dedicated connection back into your on-premises, you'd set up uh, Direct Connect in order to go into this um, configuration that's a landing zone VPC configuration that's set up with account structure and VPC set up through the landing zone. And then the second uh, sort of one that's important in this example is using Active Directory Connector. So I mentioned this already. So this is going and connecting back to Active Directory on-premises in order to, uh, to utilize your Active Directory through authentication. And then it'll, you know, it'll, it'll utilize an IAM role in order to figure out what services from AWS that person can access. All right, use cases. I call this one new products. So you can tell me if these use cases are appropriate. You'd like to hear about other use cases. So I'm just going to quickly introduce a few components of our serverless architecture before I go over these use cases. So Lambda. So these, these first started off as triggers, right? 
triggers. If something happens in S3, something happens in DynamoDB, you can execute, say, a Python script or not .NET script. So it's basically, I equated, I came from Oracle database. I mean, hell, databases have triggers forever, right? Something happens on a table and you fire off something. Why not have it for the application space? So now we have triggers. And then you can also, we extended it using our API gateway, which I think is listed on here, yeah. Extended it so that you could actually call these Lambda functions from a, a web page or, or any, any type of other mechanism that's ac accessible through an API gateway, right? The other uh, key component is obviously S3 object-based store. That's one of our serverless architectures. And the reason it's serverless is because you're not running anything, right? You're not managing anything. You don't have to worry about compute. You don't have to worry about scale. You don't have to worry about really where it's located. You just store stuff out there. DynamoDB, serverless as well. No SQL database. You don't have to manage it. You don't have to scale it up. You don't have to worry about any of the uh, management and monitoring of it. And then SQS is our simple queuing service, which is our our first service that is API driven and has endpoints that are all publicly accessible to do queuing and then SNS uh, to do publish and su subscribe of messages. You can send mes text messages, email messages, whatever you want. So these are some core components of our serverless applications. So the reason I bring this up is I love this because um, I actually, in my first job out of college, I did mainframe programming, if you can believe that programmed in COBOL, JCL, CICS, Assembler. And so uh, down on the bottom, you see an IBM DB2 database. So what Vanguard did is for one of their core insurance policy applications is that they, they, they couldn't move this database. This database is massive. This database has thousands of applications talking to it. I would look at it as like a master data management, right? This is like the core essential database for their business. But they said, hey, we want to move to Lambda. We want to move to, to, to serverless here. And we ha want to have an, a data analytics solution that resides on AWS. Because we feel it's too expensive in order to run this data analytics solution on premises. So the approach they took is they actually have database writers that are Lambda functions, which write to DB2 on the mainframe. And then they use a local company called Attunity. People might be familiar with Attunity. They actually do, have been in the business for a long time, moving data. In fact, they're one of our first partners around loading data into Redshift, or data, data warehouse. They actually have adapters for the mainframe, reads out, calls a Lambda function, and then writes to, on-premises, it writes to a RDS or a NoSQL database. The fascinating part I thought about this use case was that I'm like, why the hell are they writing to you know, a relational database, RDS, and why are they writing to NoSQL? Well, Vanguard went out there and they, they queried their business users and they said, hey, do you guys want a NoSQL database or do you want a relational database? Half the people said, we want NoSQL, half said RDS. So they said, that's pretty easy. We don't care because we're capturing these changes from the mainframe. We can write a quick Lambda function that dumps it to NoSQL or to RDS. So now they have. Uh, They've satisfied their business users. They got a new data analytics solution on AWS. So that's a new product, right? Something they're able, they weren't feel they're capable of doing on, the, on their legacy mainframe. Example number two, a little bit more convoluted, but I'll try to make it simplified. This is Capital One. Capital One had a huge initiative out of digital transformation. In fact, one of the solutions, because because of this architecture that, that uh, Capital One is able to introduce is the Echo. So now you can use the Amazon Echo at home and say, hey, what's my balance? What's my last transaction? That's hard to do, and the data was residing on a mainframe. Early in my career, I had a project at FedEx. And do you realize, well, at least at the time, this was about, well, I shouldn't say early in my career, this was about 10 years ago. I went and talked to FedEx, and they said, we got to get this is killing us because every time someone goes out there and looks and does a tracking call to see where my package is at, it goes back to an IMS database on a mainframe and it costs me anywhere between 25 and 75 cents a transaction. So in order to just be an annoyance, and I was, I was a little bit younger at the time, I went out there and I kept clicking on my tracking package thing because I wanted to see how much I could you know, get up to like $1,000 in charges. But, so it's expensive to do things on a mainframe, right? Same thing here. And that's a read, that's a query. 
Well, what Capital One did is they went out there and looked at their landscape. They looked at their applications that are a mainframe, and 90%, well, actually 80%, sorry, because I'm on camera, 80% were queries and reads. And they're like, this is crazy. It's costing us a lot of money to do these queries and reads. So what they did is they did two things. They used a cool, sophisticated technology called FTP on top. Very sophisticated data integration. So they were following my best practices around foundational layers, using data integration via FTP. And the other was a, a queue. So they did do queuing as well. And those were for the CICS transactions because they needed to be more interactive, more, more synchronous in nature in order to get those transactions over. But they decided to dump them into a DynamoDB. So they went strictly NoSQL because these are read transactions. And so what that allowed them to do is to move and, and, and create these new applications, such as the Amazon Echo and mobile banking. Because it was much easier to do mobile banking and Echo integration when your data is now off the mainframe. The other thing that they're exploring right now is now that they have this data, most of it is that switching. And I talked about master of data management and having all this data in your, in your primary source of truth on the mainframe. Now that they're starting to move this data off, they're finding that they can almost do most of their processing, their batch processing on AWS, because most of that data is now resident on AWS. All right, edge systems. I'm going to have to go quick. All right, so um, this is just systems. There, there's a project I can't talk about right now, but I'll, I mentioned Snowball Edge here. So in case you're not familiar with Snowball Edge, is you can actually run EC2 compute small compute, as well as Lambda functions at the edge. So once again, AWS is almost getting to the point where we're offering you compute in your data center. I mean, it's getting, it's getting like so that you can you know, do some of this stuff at the edge. And you can do that with Snowball Edge. We have a large cruise line that's looking at putting these on cruise ships, right? Because you can't always rely on the connecti connectivity on a cruise ship. So, um, and then and doing some of the processing, and then every night or so often, then you just push that data up into AWS. So this is our um, green grass runs Lambda functions, so you're running compute at the edge. Sometimes you don't want it, like I said, I mean, I talk to some customers, and I'm like, you're pushing that much data up into AWS? I mean, hell, it's driving up, it's driving up storage on AWS, but I don't think it's the best thing for the customer, right? So allowing customers to do some of that compute at the edge is important in IoT, and that's what we're providing right there. And this is um, Energy Allies. So they work with companies like McDonald's, Panera, Pizza Hut. And what they provide is two things. Is one thing, and this is a big thing in the industry, right, is like, when is a machine going to break? Can't tell you the number of times. And, I don't know, McDonald's isn't using their technology all that well right now, but I go to get my son a chocolate shake at McDonald's, and they're like, our shake machine is broken. I'm like, you're losing a lot of money here, because my son loves your shakes. But So the, pro the, the idea is you could do pre preemptive maintenance, right, by having IoT, by having stuff at the edge, and then you send that back to AWS and you do some analytics. When's this machine most likely to break down? This, isn't, this doesn't seem to be working too well. The other thing is, is they're putting these devices in order to save energy costs. When can, I, when can I turn down the heater? When, 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 uh, when's a good time for me to not be running a certain machine? So the likes of McDonald's have seen like 30% energy cost savings within their, within their restaurants using this technology. New, and I call this, I, I mentioned data center extension, right? So this is extending your data center into AWS. This is the opposite. This is sort of the inverse in a way, extending AWS into your data center. And now VMware, which we have a great partnership with, you can run Amazon RDS, so that's Oracle, that's SQL Server, MariaDB, Postgres, MySQL, did I mention that? Five or six databases that we manage for you. You can run them in a managed environment on premises. So this is running inside of VMware. Now the cool thing about this, when I talk to some people, is that <clears throat> they like running VC vCenter, vSphere, they, they don't have to retrain people, right? So that's one of the big reasons that people choose a solution like that, is that I don't have to go retrain my management people, my operations people, my database people, my DevOps people, is that they can use the same tools they use on AWS and then use them on-prem as well. And they can use AWS on-prem. So cloud bursting. 
folks familiar with Spot? So yeah, do you like the fact that you know before you used to bid on Spot, and now it's not really this whole arbitrage bidding thing, right? You just ask for a price, and if you get it, you bid it. And I sort of liked the old ways where you bid, you didn't know if you were going to get it. You, you, <laughs> you did feel like that. It's uh, sort of like, you remind me now, I went to Auto Trader or something in Manchester for 10, I bought a car up there, and the guy's like, uh, this is the price. And I'm like, oh, I want to I wanna, I wanna heckle with you. And the guy's like, no, we don't heckle here. I'm like, oh, that's boring. I'm going to go buy my car somewhere else. So, so, so anyway, so this is spot is you don't heckle anymore, but you can get up to 90% savings off of on demand. So we have capacity out there, right? Excess capacity that we're not utilizing. So we give this opportunity to do spot. Now the good thing about spot is you're going to save a lot of money. The bad thing about spot is go away. The good thing that we now offer you is the ability to dehydrate and hydrate that. So we have a hibernation mechanism. We'll give you a two-minute morning before you just sort of went away. So you have to be real careful. And believe it or not, even when it just went away, we had some really innovative and young companies out there that were running their entire website off of Spot. Seems a little frightening to me. <laughs> but they were. But now, with the ability to get that warning and be able to you know, hydrate that stuff somewhere and then rehydrate it, you know, that gives you maybe, maybe the potential to do that a little less scary. So this is uh, Fusec FX. They do a lot of the video transcoding, a lot of the video stuff. And you can see, I mean, I only have seven minutes, so I'm going to go through that quickly. But um, you know, when you set up hardware, right, it takes you a long time to provision that. It takes you a long time. And the, the big thing about this, I think, is what people don't talk about sometimes is the fact that now you bought this stuff, what the hell do you do with it once you don't need it anymore? Right? Now you got all this hardware. Well, you're going to find some other project that maybe needs some hardware. And that, they call that out is uh, inexpensive computer usage, pay for what you use, and obviously near unlimited capacity. I mean, obviously you could get iced. I don't know if people are familiar with the term iced. It's where you ask for, say, 1,000, 2,000 instances, and we just don't have them available right there. We're going to come back and say, sorry, not available. It doesn't happen all that often, but it could happen to you. All right, so this is uh, quickly what they're doing, cloud bursting. They chose to not use like Tsunami or some cool technology like FTP. They actually use their own custom synchronization solution. Or they could have used Cloud Endure, or they could have used uh, Cloud Velox or Zerto or something like uh, that. And they use Accumulo, which is, a, is like a, we have our NFS uh, clustered file system that we offer, uh, Elastic File System. But they choose to use a third party clustered file system in order to do that. And then they use Spot in order to do the, the video processing. Video processing is a classic one, right, where you can really do Spot. EMR is another classic one. A lot of people use EMR clusters when they can take you know, a downtime on a batch job because you can always fire it back up. And then data center extension. A couple of examples here. And the, the first example is running your database on premises. And this example is really when you're talking about people that, for some reason, for security reasons, or they just don't feel comfortable running their database you know, on AWS. So like, or like the other example I gave on the mainframe, where things are just so entwined, right? And it's like, whoa, there's so many apps over here on premises that are interfacing with this Oracle database. And I just can't afford to move this thing right now. So I'm going to keep it there. So then you can move all of your front end stuff. And this is probably, this example, I'm going to show you reverse example. This one's probably the more common one, right? Because then you can easily um, run your app web and app servers on AWS. Right? So, because that, those are a little bit more standalone. And then communicate back to your Oracle database. Um, one, of the, one of the first um, examples of this was actually Campbell's Soup. They were actually running Oracle Rack inside of a data pipe, which is a partner of ours, Colo facility. So they're running their Oracle Rack databases over here, and then they're running all of their web and application server tiers on AWS. Uh, this example is more of a what I call database freedom. And when I talked about replatforming, right, I gave that example of replatforming. This example is actually running your database um, on AWS, and for some reason you decide that your web and application tier, it's so monolithic, it's so old, it's so entangled, 
it's got so many different components to it that I just can't move it. I gotta leave it on prem because this thing is so brittle, so fragile, but I wanna free myself from some Oracle licenses. And so I'll move to Oracle, or I'll move to Aurora Postgres. So this is another possible example. The nice one about this example, in case you're not aware of it, is that our elastic load balancers, well, I call them elastic load balancers, now we have network load balancers, which are TCP IP, and we have um, application load balancers, which, uh, which load balance at the HTTP, HTTPS layer, um, is you, could, you can actually still run that on AWS, and, 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 because, and then you could use CloudFront, Route 53, you could use all those to, 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 to load balance your uh, um, web service and application service on, um, on your um, on-premises. So you can load balance both across AWS instances as well as um, is ones running on-premises. All right, this one is Brook Brothers. Brook Brothers, it was funny because I, one of the questions I asked in order to get a book at a conference I just was at is like, one of the questions was, how, when was Brook Brothers founded? And the guy ran up right after the presentation, he opened up his suit. It was 1818. He had it in his inside, and it's like, wow, it's embroidered in the suit, suit coat? And he goes, yeah. So 1818, they've been around for a long time. Um, I wanted to point out, see, they're running the R instance type, so that's a lot of RAM, right? When I joined the company, and I go back to this, it's, it's 256 gigs of RAM was the most that you could get, 256. Now we just introduced uh, close to 12 terabyte. So we've come a long way again. I mean, I, when we introduced the two terabytes, I was like, God, ah, two terabyte XL is like crazy. And that was actually driven by SAP. SAP was the company that was just on us to say, we need bigger memory instance types, and the reason they need them is because of HANA. So HANA is the in-memory column uh, um, OLAP-based uh, database for doing analytics and things like and queries like that. So uh, they really pushed us hard, and we and I just actually this was just a few days ago that we introduced the, the 12 terabyte um, instance uh, memories. But these they're using the R family that was sort of the the, the classic family. And they're using Direct Connect. So here they're using Direct Connect. The other thing I wanted to point out is that they use their Quick Starts. So I talked about Quick Starts. So Quick Starts allows you to, to set up your VPC, your VPC subnets, your security groups, the instance types, and you can query too. I mean, you can, you can give the user a choice. What do you want to, how do you want to deploy this? But it's a templatized using CloudFormation, templatized template that we work with, like in the likes of SAP and all of our partners, Microsoft, to create these templates that quickly allow you to deploy like an SAP HANA environment on AWS. This one is uh, Kellogg's, another company that's been around for quite some time. Kellogg's decided, they took a little bit slower approach and they decided to run test and dev on AWS. And they're actually still keeping their ERP and production HANA on premises. But they, they took their promotional systems that run HANA and ran them, uh, are running them on AWS. So they're still running some of their core stuff in terms of SAP HANA, but in terms of promotional, they found that the cost and the scalability just wasn't there for on-prem because promotions take a lot of data, right? They're gonna crush a lot of data and say, what's the best marketing campaign we should run? So they're running that stuff on AWS, but they're running their traditional uh, sort of analytics on-premises. The, the interesting thing that I find here is that they're actually, they don't even need a direct connect. Which you would think if you're running in sort of a data center extension mode that you would want direct connect, but they're using VPN. Works for them. And then you can read this one. All, everything that I talk about in this session is publicly accessible. And I did it that way just so you could read more about things. So if you want more information, we do have a hybrid cloud website which I am in the process of working with on marketing on changing because I don't believe the way we position some of this stuff and hopefully this foundational layer and all these use cases I talked about will be up there soon. We are working on an ebook and a white paper. And um, you can look at the enterprise compute which you'll find a lot of these Kellogg's and enterprise stories there. And then of course you have to go out and buy you know, this book which is gonna be brilliant for you. Um, and let me see, I had I had two questions, so. Oh, we got one more, so you see they're going in for the book. Uh, 
I would say they're in the public ones. The public ones, I, I, and I could give them to you if you give me your card. I would say they're in the probably the 20th, 20 range, somewhere in there, the public ones. They're, they're using it actually, to the, not the cache, but the, in order to replicate up to AWS. Yeah. Yeah. Not to have S3 as the primary storage, I think is what you're asking. We should talk afterwards. I think, I think there's a document in that. <laughs> I think there, no, we don't have anything like that, but that would be a good one. In fact, that just came up with a customer I was, I was meeting with. This idea, I think this is where you're going with it. This idea of you don't really care what it's running, but you need something to orchestrate it and figure out where the data is at, figure the best way to run the application, and then sort of push it where it needs to go, right? Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't have anything, but I like, I like the idea. So you have to give me your card. Yeah, the one thing I didn't talk about with like that Capital One example and the Vanguard one example, there was a lot, they did a lot of work in order to optimize those Lambda functions. So, yes. It's, you know, I hate to, I hate to sound like an architect, but it depends. <laughs> and almost everyone that I've been aware of has to go through some type of use X-ray, use some other tools, use App Dynamics. Use New Relic in order to figure out what your pain points are, and you're gonna you're gonna have to optimize. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming. I'll be up here for a few minutes to answer questions.